Hello and welcome back to Get Up and Game. My name is Josh and in this video I'm going to be continuing my Change Your Game series, a series all about experiencing and enjoying the incredible variety Marvel Champions offers. In the last video I talked about how to find inspiration for building decks within a hero kit, identifying major themes that hero plays well with and seeking to expand upon them. In this video we're going to do a similar thing, only instead of examining a hero kit, we're going to do a deep dive into the aspects and find out what those have to offer our intrepid heroes. I see the question asked occasionally, how do you know which aspect is best to play a certain hero in? Well, in my opinion, while there is a solid answer to that question for most heroes, a big part of the fun puzzle of deck building is finding synergies for a hero in every aspect. Outside of a few exceptions, every color has something to offer every hero. It's learning how to mesh the two that can be tricky. And you could look at it from an opposite perspective too. Let's say a cool new card just came out that you could build a whole deck around like flow like water or one way or another. These tentpole cards create brand new strategies or enhance existing ones to such a degree that you can't help but be excited to build that deck. But how do you know which heroes it will work well in? Well, that's the focus of our discussion today. We're going to go through the aspects one by one, identifying each of its major themes. And I'm also gonna be highlighting many of the major deck archetypes that are possible with each aspect. Now, I think this might be a longer one, so I hope you're ready to dive in. And also, you may have noticed I've busted out my Kana Heroes 2022 playmat for this video. Tickets went on sale today for Con of Heroes 2023, and I'm super excited about it. So I just wanted to share, if you have an opportunity to go to the convention in Minnesota in May, it's an absolute blast. I went this year and I'm going again next year and I could not be more excited. I'm not affiliated with the con or anything, just a, a big fan, so I wanted to share that as well. Let's get started. Before we get into the individual aspects, I wanted to talk a little bit about how they're designed. There are three major questions in Marvel Champions that the players need to concern themselves with. How do I manage threat? How do I deal damage to minions and the villain? And how do I survive long enough to win? And to one degree or another, each aspect provides answers for those questions. And each hero provides answers to those questions as well. The fascinating thing about deck building in this game is seeing how those answers mesh together in a beautiful harmony of creativity. For example, if you ask Valkyrie, how are you going to manage threat? Her answer is going to be, mm, not so good. But then Justice comes along and says, I got your back, bruh. But if you ask Hulk how he's going to deal damage, he'll say, Hulk smash. And then Aggression comes along and says, let's do this. And then there's Hawkeye. Uh, Mr. Hawkeye, Mr. Hawkeye, sir, how are you planning on surviving till the end of the game? Um, uh, um, we will die for you. And the marriage of Aspect and Hero is a two-way street. After all, the Aspects aren't without their own problems. Uh, we killed everything, sir, but, uh... Sigh, don't worry, I'll take care of this mess. Aggression might be able to kill everything, but it's gonna struggle with the side schemes. Then Justice comes along and cleans everything up, but... Why is the villain still at full health? I'll take care of this. Justice not so good at chunking down the villain's health. And protection, well... Help me sigh and then of course there's leadership hey do you guys need some help no no we're just fine the point is while an aspect can be used to shore up a hero's weaknesses the hero kit can also be used to balance out where an aspect is lacking this is why i love the deck building in this game so much and why i'm trying so hard to encourage everyone to give it a shot okay on to the actual aspect talk so when looking at the major themes of Justice, we're going to be talking threat management and being rewarded for threat management. Justice is also where your alter ego likes to hang out. Now when it comes to threat management, Justice is so good at it that it actually has four different ways to do it. The first and most obvious way is through events. For Justice and Clear the Area are so cost efficient, they could probably end up in just about any yellow deck, and they're especially good at dealing with side schemes. But past those, they start to get a little more hero, player count, or scenario dependent. Lay Down the Law is good if you are a flipping hero. Yawn Roll works well if you're aerial. As well as Agile Flight, though this is probably a little bit better in multiplayer, where you have more threat to remove. Speaking of multiplayer, Crisis Averted is another good option since it removes such a big chunk of threat. 
even the odds can remove a whole bunch of threat off side schemes. The more players, the better. I really like multitasking in scenarios with multiple main schemes like Venom Goblin and Tower Defense, or if you just know you're gonna be seeing a lot of side schemes, but I wouldn't put this in just about every deck. And if you're gonna be playing a lot of events, be sure to bring along a sense of justice to help pay for them. Now, events can be unreliable sometimes, so a nice way to supplement them is with what we call passive threat removal. This comes in the form of upgrades and supports that stay on the table. They aren't as cost efficient as the events, but they make up for it in reliability. I really like using these in a higher player count game where the game is going to last longer. You can just remove threat every single turn for a long time. Or if I'm playing solo with a hero with a lower hand size, I might use them as well since I'm less likely to draw into the events when I need them. A third way to manage threat is just to prevent it from coming out altogether. This can be especially effective in solo and in scenarios where the threat threshold is low and you don't always have time to remove the threat before it becomes a problem. Cards like Great Responsibility and Foiled will lower the threat as it comes out. Counterintelligence can prevent a big chunk of three. And Under Surveillance isn't really threat prevention, but it extends the threshold of the scheme by four, and that is particularly good in schemes like Ultron or The Hood where the threat threshold is low. It's easy to lose that scheme to an advance, so it's nice to just have a little bit more breathing room, though I think it loses its luster a bit in higher player counts since the threat is already going so high. And the final and most reliable way to deal with threat is your hero activation. Now, if your hero only has one in its thwart and is more inclined to be attacking or defending, you'll probably need to be including a lot of threat removal instead. But if your hero has a thwart of two or higher, then it's worth building into it with a heroic intuition and making an entrance is a nice option as well if you know you're going to be exhausting your hero to thwart. And it's even better if you're playing a hero like Captain America who has fearless determination, which encourages him to thwart, as well as Rocket Raccoon has the thruster boots that increase his thwart to three. And then I've got a plan boosts it even further when he thwarts, so he's really incentivized to thwart. That's where you probably want to lean into your hero's basic activation for thwarting, and that frees up a lot of room in the deck to lean into the other elements that Justice offers besides threat removal, because you won't really need to include that much in your deck. Your hero is already so good at it. And the first alternative benefit Justice offers besides removing threat is being rewarded for removing threat. If you are really good at justicing, there are a lot of really cool bonuses you can get, like Justice Served will ready you when you clear a scheme, Turn the Tide does three damage if you clear a scheme, which is really efficient for zero cost. Chance Encounter lets you search for an ally in your deck or discard pile and add it to your hand, giving you a lot of flexibility, not to mention a card back. Skilled Investigator lets you draw a card when you clear a side scheme. And Followed will deal four damage. So if you're really good at removing threat, then there's room in your deck to include cards like these that'll give you really good benefits for it. And in a similar fashion, cards like Pivotal Moment and Venom benefit from having the main scheme clear. So if you think that's something you're going to be able to do consistently, those are pretty good cards to include in your Justice deck as well. And if you own it one way or another is sort of the key that binds it all together. Cards like Skilled Investigator, Chance Encounter, Turn the Tide, they really want you to have side schemes and good access to them. And one way or another brings it into play for you, guarantees that you'll have one. And so you can make use of all these other good effects. And the final major theme that Justice plays into is Confuse. Concussive Blow and Sonic Rifle can be played by anyone, and Guardians can also make use of Think Fast. Now, Confuse in and of itself is just okay, but when combined with a hero that can make really, really strong use of their alter ego, like Ms. Marvel, Black Widow, Wasp, War Machine needs to flip down so he can flip back up. Colossus is very similar in that way. If you have access to Confuse in those situations, it's an incredibly powerful effect. But even just for your average hero that maybe has one Alter Ego support, flipping down just to use that and also getting to draw the extra card and maybe healing is really nice as well. And particularly in solo play, this is really, really helpful. In multiplayer, it's less necessary because you're probably going to be able to get to Alter Ego more frequently since the other players can help pick up your slack. But certainly in solo and even in two player, I really, really like including some form of Confuse in my Justice decks. So obviously Justice has threat on lockdown, but what about the other two big questions we have to ask? How does it do in the damage and survivability departments? And the answer is so-so. Outside of Stealth Strike and Concussive Blow, which are general purpose damage, the rest of its damage is pretty conditional. Followed requires you to have a side scheme in play. 
Brains Over Brawn is a decent card if there were a hero that had a high enough thwart to make this worthwhile. And I'm wondering now that maybe Phoenix can make good use of this card and maybe Rocket, but outside of that, it's, it's just not that great. Turn the Tide is a pretty nice option to deal three damage. Swift Retribution wants you to let the villain scheme before it'll deal the damage. Scare Tactic requires the villain to be confused. And Pivotal Moment needs you to have the main scheme cleared of all threat. So there are a lot of different ways to do damage injustice. They all are just kind of so-so and don't do the big damage you're looking for to defeat the villain. That's where you're going to need to turn to your hero cards and your allies to do most of the damage. And Justice's allies are actually pretty decent for damage. Venom hits for three. Quasar attacks for two. Wraith attacks for three. Jessica Jones, two. Daredevil, two. Quake, two. So a lot of the Justice allies are actually better at attacking than thwarting. So that's certainly something you're going to want to be including in a Justice deck. You're going to need to deal some damage. And the allies are a pretty decent option. And similarly, for survivability, you're going to be relying on your other friends at the table, your hero cards, or your allies to do your blocking, because other than making an entrance for a little bit of healing and the opportunity to go to Alter Ego once in a while to hide, there's not a lot here that's going to help you stay alive. So to summarize, if you're planning on using your hero activation to thwart, if you find yourself losing to threat a lot, or you just like to go to Alter Ego more often, then Justice might be the aspect for you. Now let's talk about what kind of cool Justice decks are out there. So first, let's think about what a Justice deck looks like for a hero who isn't particularly good at thwarting. Not coincidentally, these are also the heroes that can struggle to win consistently in solo. I'm thinking of She-Hulk, War Machine, Valkyrie, Drax, Hulk, Spider-Man. These heroes have more than enough damage potential to get the job done, but if too many side schemes pop out or the advance comes out at the wrong time, that's going to be a loss. In this situation, I would keep it nice and well-rounded, nothing too fancy. We just need to keep from getting bogged down on threat before these guys can use their hero cars to do what they need to be doing. So a nice mix of thwart events, a little bit of confuse, and some pretty solid allies make for a really nice solo justice deck for the types of heroes that really don't have room to include the fancy stuff. You just need enough help to keep the threat under control long enough to win. Another well-rounded deck in Justice is the Shield Package from Miles Morales. If you've got Sinister Motives, you can just take out all Miles' extra cards and pop them into just about anyone else. Though I would remove the Web Warrior stuff and put in allies or other cards that are more appropriate to the hero you're playing, but the Shield stuff just works so well on its own. It kind of doesn't even matter what hero you're playing with. It gives you really good threat removal, damage, some fun combos to play around with. So if you've got Sinister Motives, this is a Justice deck just waiting to be put with any hero. But certain heroes can play it better than others. If you've got a hero like Black Widow who has some shield traded cards, Captain Marvel has some ties to shield, as well as Hawkeye, these heroes can make particularly good use of the shield deck. But really, it's fun in just about any hero. Now, I mentioned one way or another earlier, but this card really does make a whole deck in and of itself. Being able to draw the three cards off of that just for fetching the side scheme is super beneficial. And then being able to take advantage of clearing the side scheme with Just to Serve, Chance Encounter, Turn the Tide, Skilled Investigator, and there's a few other cards as well. Just makes for an incredibly fun way to play, a really powerful deck that works well. For just about any hero, though, I wouldn't really run it in heroes that aren't so good at thwarting because you just, you're going to need to add a lot of thwart cards to their decks. But if your hero is at least decent at thwarting, or even better, if they're really good at thwarting with their basic activation, this is a really exceptionally good deck. I really like playing it with Phoenix, Rocket, Captain America, Ms. Marvel, and Wasp. They're all just so good at removing threat in one way or another, and they can make good advantage. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> And they can just take really good advantage of some of the other benefits as well. So this is one of my favorite ways to play Justice. And if you have the cards, I highly, highly recommend leaning hard into one way or another. The final major archetype I would say you can find present in a good Justice deck is the Confuse Lock deck. With Concussive Blow and Sonic Rifle and, again, Think Fast for Guardians. This works particularly well in Guardians because of that card. You can pretty reasonably expect to keep the villain confused on almost every turn, and it works even better if you're playing a hero that already naturally has access to confuse. It's just gonna be that much more consistent. And then once you've got the villain confused, you can hit him with damage from cards like Scare Tactic, 
and you'll probably have more confuses than you need. So Swift Retribution, that allows you to force the villain to scheme and then deal four damage to them. If they're just confused, it's fine. They just clear the confuse, you deal four damage to them. And then you've probably got another card in your hand to just confuse them again, so it works pretty well. And you can also include Professor X to get another confuse out of it if you want to. So I talked about it earlier in the confuse section, but this is a really, really fun deck for the heroes that make particularly good use of their alter ego. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that those are the only types of decks you can build in Justice. Certainly every single hero can find something interesting to do that's individual to them. But when looking at the aspect in and of itself, those are the major archetypes I see that you could be excited to build in just about any hero. And so I'd be curious to hear from you what heroes you're now interested in trying in Justice. Now, looking at aggression, I feel like in some ways it's the polar opposite of justice in that where yellow thrives, red struggles, and vice versa. But at the same time, they're basically two sides of the same coin, and you could mostly take everything I just said about justice and apply it here if you change all the times I said thwart to damage. Because obviously aggression is all about damage and has lots of ways of doing it, but one thing that is different between it and justice, where justice relies super heavily on events, and then supplements with hero activations and passive prevention and removal. Red's damage is pretty equally split among events, your basic attack, and its allies. Now, when looking at the damage events, unlike for justice and clear the area in the yellow aspect, there really isn't a standout must include attack event. Relentless Assault is probably the closest, but even then it is limited to minions. Most of Red's damage events are very situational. Clobber's another one that's pretty straightforward and I would include in most decks, but if you draw into it later in the turn, like if you're playing a deck with a lot of card draw, this might not be the best option. Quick Strike is really good if you have a super high attack. Uppercut's probably overcosted for what you want to be doing, but with Hone Technique it can be good. Surprise Attack is nice if you're a flipping hero. No Quarter has some interesting implications to it. One by One is nice in scenarios with lots of smaller minions. Dive Bomb is a really nice option if you have easy access to the aerial trait. Dropkick is one of my favorite aggression cards that it gives you access to stun and card draw. It only does four damage for three, but it gives you a lot of benefits. So, but it does require you to play in all punch resources. So again, it is limited in that way. You gotta be careful. Pitchback also good if you have easy access to aerial. Melee is nice for a scenario with lots of minions. Fuselade requires you to have a weapon, but it does a big chunk of damage. And similar to Justice, if you're going to be playing all these events, make sure you pack a Martial Prowess to help pay for them. So there are a ton of good options for damage, but when you're building your aggression deck, you really have to be thinking about what type of scenario you're facing more than some of the other aspects, because the cards are all pretty situational, and depending on what you're going up against will determine which events you include. But as many different events as there are, aggression just really, really wants you to attack with your hero. There are a lot of cards that boost your basic attack. Combat training is... Pretty much the standard give you plus one attack the god slayer can give you plus two more attack it's kind of pricey but if you're going to be attacking a lot of unique enemies or just hitting the villain a lot it's good fluid motion will boost your attack when you play events hand canyon boosts your attack and gives you overkill skilled strike gives your attack plus two mean swing gives you a higher attack if you have a weapon to exhaust and Brute Force is kind of a weird card that it gives you plus one attack until you make an attack and then you discard it. So this is only really good in specialized builds. But there are so many cards in Aggression that boost your basic attack that clearly, if you're playing a hero with a really high attack that you plan on using their basic activation to attack a lot, this is probably a good way to go. I would focus more on this than using the events as much just because you're gonna be able to really swing for a lot of damage. So if you're playing a hero with a really high attack like Thor, Hulk, Hawkeye, this would be a direction I would really take a aggression deck. But not only does aggression really want you to play with its interesting events, and not only does aggression really, really want you to just attack with your hero, aggression really, really wants you to play allies because it also has a ton of really good allies that are relatively low costed for how much attack they give you. Marvel Boy gives you two attack. Wasp gives you three attack as long as you pay for her with lightning resources. Angela is a zero cost ally that gives you two attack, but you do have to go find a minion, but actually that's not gonna bother you too much when you see what else aggression likes to do. Throg gives you two attack and a tough, potentially. Spider Girl gives you two attack. Hulk can attack for three, though it's risky. Bug is a consistent attacker or thwarter because you can heal him with your basic attack, so he plays well with the cards we were just talking about. 
And Wolverine is expensive, but he is going to stick around, and I think he is definitely one of the best new aggression allies. Three damage and piercing and healing all in one. I think you're going to be putting Wolverine in most of your aggression decks. So aggression really gives you a lot, a lot of options for which way you want to go with how you're dealing your damage. And aggression also includes the energy spear that you can put on Bug or Angela to boost its attack even higher and boot camp to boost all of your allies attack. So there are a ton of good options for an ally swarm deck in aggression. So depending on what type of your hero you're playing will really inform which way you want to take the damage. If you have a hero that already wants to attack really hard, the last round of cards is really good. But if not, then you might consider doing a mix of the allies and the events from earlier in your aggression decks. Now, in the same way that Justice rewards you for clearing schemes, Aggression rewards you for summoning and killing minions. And the harder you murder them, the better. There's Relentless Assault that lets you do overkill damage. No Quarter will let you potentially draw cards depending on how much extra damage you did to a minion. Into the Fray will remove Threat equal to excess damage. Moment of Triumph will heal you equal to excess damage. So you really want to be hitting the minions as hard as you can and you really want there to be minions in front of you in order to take advantage of these effects and you can also use battle fury to ready you for taking out the minions and bring it to draw cards before you kill the minions one card for each minion in front of you so in a lot of ways aggression really relies on minions to be successful but if you have access to them it'll give you pretty much everything else you need threat removal healing card draw and readying so when playing aggression, especially in solo, you really want to be thinking about scenarios that have access to a lot of minions or there are ways and heroes that will bring minions into play for you like Thor and Valkyrie can summon minions and Rocket Raccoon also benefits from dealing excess damage. So those are the types of heroes that can play really, really well in solo aggression because you want to make the most of it. In multiplayer, you pretty much just play anybody and just pack your deck full of damage and don't worry about anything else. And that's actually pretty much it for Aggression's major themes. It's just damage, more damage, and more damage. So when asking our three primary questions when playing Marvel Champion, Red's answer to how will you deal damage is just yes. But when it comes to the other two questions, much like Justice, it is a mixed bag. Now for threat removal, Aggression is actually getting better and better, but it is going to make you work for it. There's Looking for Trouble that will remove three threat from the main scheme, but it also searches for a minion and puts it in play in front of you, which, after talking about the last cards, you might not mind so much if you have to go get a minion. Chase Them Down will let you remove two threat from any scheme, and that's key. That's one of the only ways aggression has to remove threat from side schemes. But this is actually a pretty good card for zero. As long as you kill a minion, you can remove two threat from a scheme. Gatekeeper is a really interesting new card. You have to put it on a minion. Again, this requires minions to make this work. And it gives them extra hit points and patrol, but when you defeat them, you get to remove four threats. So it's four threat removal for zero, but you have to work a little bit harder to kill the minion. And Smash the Problem will let you exhaust your hero and remove threat equal to your attack, but then you're giving up your basic attack, so that card is interesting for certain heroes. And You'll Pay for That lets you remove threat from any scheme after you take a big chunk of damage. So there are ways to remove threat in Aggression but they pretty much require you to either be taking damage or having minions in play. So again, in solo play, you're gonna really want your hero to have decent access to thwart as well because these options are all somewhat unreliable. But in multiplayer, you don't really care about removing threat anyway, so that won't be a problem. And as far as survivability in aggression goes, I think it actually goes in the wrong direction. With things like counterattack and toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I have a feeling aggression is actually finding a way to kill itself as fast as possible. Now, I'm mostly joking because you can use Moment of Triumph to heal a big chunk of life if you have the right situation for it, but there aren't a lot of things keeping you alive in aggression. You're going to need to rely on allies for chump blocking or, again, your hero cards or other players at the table. In solo, it's pretty easy to die when playing an aggression deck, so you got to be careful. So, in summary, if you're a fan of the Cobra Kai school of thought, strike first, strike hard, no mercy, sir. you have a hero that already wants to be attacking, and you're actually happy when a minion pops out of the encounter deck, an aggression deck might be right for you. Now, when it comes to building aggression decks, for solo play, there's the Rush Down the Villain in Three Turns deck, and then pretty much all the other ones. So you can't talk about building an aggression deck without talking about the Rush deck. It's really more of a novelty, but it is a fun thing to do once in a while. 
Now it plays best with a hero with high attack, a lot of health, and good attack events of their own. So like Thor, Star-Lord, Drax, and Hulk. And there's others as well, but these four particularly play the rush very, very well. Basically, you just want to be doing a basic attack with your hero and pumping it up with Skill Strike for two extra damage, Hand Cannon for two extra damage, Mean Swing for three more damage if you have a weapon, Fusillade for five more damage if you have a weapon, and if you have access to good attack events like Drop Kick and Clobber and things like that, you just want to be hitting the villain for his maximum damage every turn. On the second turn, you're going to flip down to Alter Ego so that you don't die. And then on the third turn, you're going to flip up and try to win. And if you don't win on that turn, you're probably going to lose because you've just been getting hit in the face by the villain and they've been doing as much scheming as they want. So this can be fun once in a while, but you either win in three turns or you don't. But like I said, that's really more of a novelty than an actual deck. If you actually want to play the game you took time setting up, a more reliable way to play aggression, especially in solo, is to use a lot of those cards. They're good, but make sure you bring things like chase them down to remove some threat, relentless assault to deal with minions, and just more general all-purpose cards. It's not going to win as fast as the rush, but it's more consistent, and you can actually deal with some of the threats as they appear. This is sort of like your basic solo aggression deck. It doesn't do anything fancy, but it gives you access to what you need. And along with the cards in your hero kit, you're going to win a lot more games than just trying to rush and either win or you don't. Now, this works particularly well if you're playing aggression in solo with heroes that can thwart really well, like Phoenix or Rocket, Gamora, Spider-Woman, Black Panther, pretty much any hero that isn't super bad at thwarting should be able to handle this kind of deck and still win in solo play. Now, another deck that will work in solo play, but it works even better in multiplayer just so you have time to set up is the minion summoning build I mentioned earlier, especially with Thor and Valkyrie, but a lot of heroes can do this. Use cards like Looking for Trouble to force a minion into play with you. Angela can also bring a minion into play with you. The more minions you can put in play that you can handle without dying, you can then use Bring It to draw a lot of cards off of those minions. Hall of Heroes will also reward you for killing minions. This is just a super, super fun way to play aggression, drawing cards and killing minions over and over again. And all that card draws, we're going to let you build up your board state. So when it's time to bring the damage to the villain, you should have everything you need in play from your hero kit to really, really be able to finish off the villain and win the game. And like I said, this works particularly well with like Thor and Valkyrie, who already are somewhat rewarded for killing minions, Rocket as well. But pretty much anybody that would like to see minions to make good use of their abilities, like Cyclops. Vision's another good one because he could ignore a lot of the damage from the villains when he's in his intangible form. Nova wants to have a lot of minions to kill in order to make use of Unleash the Nova Force. So this is a pretty good all-purpose aggression deck that you can play with a lot of heroes. Another aggression deck that can be really fun but works best in multiplayer because it takes a ton of setup is the Brute Force deck. Basically what you're trying to do is increase your basic attack with Brute Force, combat training, things like that. They're going to give you permanent boost to your attack stat, but you don't actually attack with your hero because otherwise you would lose your Brute Force. But you can get three of these into play and a combat training, that's going to be giving you plus four to your attack. So if, and if you're already playing somebody like Hawkeye or Hulk that has an attack of three already, that's seven. And then this trio of cards that came with Valkyrie, Quick Strike that deals damage equal to your attack, Smash the Problem that removes threat equal to your attack, or the Best Defense that gives you bonus defense equal to your attack. These can be extremely powerful because your attack is so high. And if you're playing someone like Scott Lang, Ant-Man, who has access to his giant strengths for his giant form that give him another plus one to his attack, you can do some insane things with this. So this is a really fun way to play. I recommend bringing some form of readying like Earth's Mightiest Heroes if you're playing an Avenger, just because you do have to exhaust to use those events, it would be nice to ready up if you had another one in your hand. But that's a really fun way to play aggression. But like I said, it works best in multiplayer just because it takes so long to set up. You're going to need everybody else to sort of manage the game for you while you're building up. But once you get set up, you'll be the one who brings the game home. Another very popular thing you can do with aggression these days is with Hone Technique. This upgrade, once it's in play, gives your attack events plus damage equal to their cost. So for example, Relentless Assault, instead of dealing five damage, would deal seven, as long as you pay for it with a mental resource. So you do have to keep that in mind. But you can definitely build a whole deck around this. This is another one that I think probably works a little bit better in multiplayer, just so you have time to set up. But the fact that it increases all of your attacks by so much melee, deals six damage and six damage, Uppercut now becomes a swinging web kick by dealing eight damage. And if you have access to the aerial trait where this probably works the best, you can then of course play dive bomb to deal 11 damage to one enemy and five damage to each other enemy. It's just insane. So once you get hone technique set up, you can do a ton, a ton of damage. 
Not to mention, it'll help you with effects like Moment of Triumph, Into the Fray, and No Quarter. You're going to be dealing even more excess damage, healing more, removing more threat, and potentially drawing more cards. So there's just a lot of good things that Hone Technique can do for you. So that is a really fun way to play. I highly recommend for Aggression. And the last deck I want to highlight for Aggression is just what I would call the All Physical Resources deck. Probably come up with a more creative name. But basically, every card in the deck should have the physical resource, so like Martial Prowess, Combat Training, Hand Cannon, Skilled Strike, Mean Swing, Dropkick. These are all useful cards anyway, but they all have just the physical resource, looking for trouble, uppercut. And what that's going to allow you to do is very consistently trigger Yarnborn to deal an extra two damage every single time you attack. And it's going to let you safely attack with Hulk because you're going to be able to trigger that fist deal two damage to an enemy pretty reliably you don't have to worry as much that you're going to hit the lightning to deal damage to every character or even worse the mental to discard hulk so when you know that the vast majority of cards in your deck are all physical resources that gives you a ton of leeway to lean into hulk and yarnborn plus all those other cards are solid anyway and heroes that can particularly make good use of it like captain america who can produce his own physical resources as well and Quicksilver, we can ready that friction resistance over and over again to keep triggering Yarnborn. So that is actually an awesome, awesome aggression deck that I highly recommend you try out. So there was a whole bunch of fun ways to play around with your red cards. Now, if justice and aggression are two sides of the same coin, protection is the odd one out. While it has all the answers you need to the question, how will I stay alive? It's fairly lacking in the other two key areas of the game, but it has come a long way since the olden days, and it's actually one of the most interesting aspects in my opinion. Now, at its heart, protection is all about improving your defense action, preventing damage, and healing. Basically, not dying. Unfortunately, not dying isn't an effective strategy for winning this game. In fact, exhausting to defend is the least impactful thing you can do with your hero. Thankfully, there are a ton of effects that will ready you and also give you other bonuses along with the defending to make it a little more worth your while. So similar to how Justice wants to remove all the threat and Aggression wants to deal extra damage, Protection wants to defend without taking damage, what we call the perfect defense. Cards like Hard to Ignore and Unflappable will reward you with threat removal and card draw if you can defend without taking damage. So that's a big, big element of playing the Protection aspect. And similar to simply just increasing your defense with the Armored Vest, it also has a lot of other useful events to either increase your defense or give you benefits for defending. So cards like Desperate Defense and Never Back Down will give you extra defense for that defense. And if you don't take damage, you either get to ready or stun the villain. And those are super, super useful. But not only do you increase your defense in protection, you can also just prevent the damage as it comes in. Energy barriers are very nice for protecting one damage at a time. Sidestep prevents three damage and can deal a damage back potentially. Jump flip prevents two damage. It can remove a little bit of threat from the main scheme. You can also prevent damage by simply discarding the boost card or preventing the damage from the boost card and actually hitting back with a little bit of damage. And speaking of dealing damage back to the villain, there's flow like water, which is going to give you a damage to back to the villain for every time you play a defense event. Powerful Punch is an amazing new card for protection that deals four damage back to an enemy that is just now attacking you. There's always been Counter Punch that will deal your attack damage back. Electrostatic Armor is basically another version of Retaliate. So there are a lot of ways to hit the villain back. You're not taking damage, but you're hitting them back. It's a little bit at a time, but it's actually a really fun way to play. Now, if you manage to keep any cards in your hand by the time you get back to your turn, there are quite a few other things protection can do for you. There's actually quite a bit of readying in protection. Indomitable will ready you after you defended. Repurpose lets you discard a tech upgrade, gives you bonuses to your basic stats, and readies you. This is a really interesting newer card. What doesn't kill me will heal you and ready you. Ever Vigilant will remove some threat and ready you if you have the aerial trait. This is a super good card for aerial heroes. Leading Blow is a really good option for heroes that have a pretty high attack. It lets you ready after you do an attack as long as you deal some damage after a boost flip. And so it's just nice that there's a lot of different ways to ready your hero because like I said earlier, exhausting to defend has the least impact on the game. It'd be better to be attacking or thwarting. There's, there's more tempo gained in those. So you know, leading blow doesn't help with that, but these other four are ways to potentially ready you after you defend it. So these are really, really nice if you're playing a hero that is going to defend a lot. There's also quite a few healing options in protection. It's not really a strategy to lean into, but it's nice to get a little health every now and then. What doesn't kill me, we just talked about a second ago, uh, heals you for two as it's readying you. 
Second Wind can heal a decent sized chunk, five damage if you pay for it with mental, but for three resources, there's probably something better you could be doing with your turn. Med Team is actually a pretty nice option. You'll get six healing out of it total for three, but you can also use it on allies and other heroes. So there's a lot of versatility in that card. Momentum Shift is just a nice, simple, you heal two damage and then deal two damage to an enemy. Protection doesn't have a lot of direct damage, so that's pretty nice. So like I said, while I wouldn't necessarily call healing a strategy in protection, it is nice to sprinkle a little into your decks. There are also a fair number of ways of doing stun in protection. There's never back down. We talked about earlier, if you defend without taking damage, you can stun the villain right back. That's pretty awesome. If you're a web warrior, you actually have access to two stuns with Thwip Thwip. Iron Fist is one of the best allies in the game because he can stun twice and still take a hit for you, all the while dealing three damage with each attack. And Tackle is also a really nice option too for stunning the villain and doing a little bit of damage. So sprinkling a little bit of stun into your decks is just a nice way to not even have to worry about defending at all. And we're not done yet. Protection has even more effects like Tough. Now Muster Courage works for Avengers. You can dole out Tufts equal to the villain stage number. So if you were playing Expert, this could be worth two or even three Tough cards. For three costs, that's pretty good. Perseverance gives you a Tough when you change form. So either from Alter Ego to Hero or if you're playing a hero like Shadowcat or Spectrum that changes forms, you can get a tough out of that. That's a super good card. Shake It Off is really good for Guardians. After you take damage, you can just get a tough for one cost. And Hard Knocks is another rare example of direct damage and protection where you can use it to deal four damage to an enemy. If it defeats the enemy, you get a tough status card. So this is an underrated card I don't see played a lot, but I think this could actually be really good for certain heroes. So similar to Stun, if you can get a tough on your turn, then you don't really have to worry about the villain attack that round. And weirdly, protection is also becoming the home of encounter card manipulation. And we've always had Black Widow that let you cancel an encounter card, but then you have to reveal another one. And we've gotten some newer ones here. Return the Favor will allow you to basically summon a treachery, but then you get to deal five damage to the villain. Spider-Man Noir will collect treacheries underneath him, and then he gets boosted stats based on it. And Spider Tingle will let Web Warriors cancel treachery cards, so... Protection has a lot of different ways to control the villain, whether it's stunning them or giving you tough, and you can also play around with the encounter cards a little bit. So protection obviously has a lot of different elements to it, and we know that it can keep you alive, but how are its thwarting and damage? Now on the damage front, it's actually getting better all the time. We talked about hard knocks, momentum shift are pretty decent options for damage. First hit is just okay. It deals two damage for one, but it could be useful in the right builds. Like I said earlier, Powerful Punch is an amazing new card that deals four damage when an enemy attacks you. This could kill a minion when it pops out, and then you never even have to worry about its attack, so that's really good. Counter Punch is okay in the right hero if you have a decent attack stat to go along with your defense. Return the Favor is risky because it's going to summon a treachery card, but it does deal five damage to the villain, which I would consider that chunk damage. Five damage is going to help you win the game. Fighting Fit also deals five damage, but only if you're at full health. So there's some interesting things you can do with a card like that. So there are quite a few options for direct damage on your hero turn, along with all the ping damage that you're gonna be doing during the villain phase. But it can be a little bit difficult to directly affect minions just because Hard Nox is kind of expensive. Powerful Punch requires them to be attacking, things like that. So it's not as simple as just, boom, knocking out minions, but there are ways to work around it. But as for removing threat, well, let's just say you better hope you don't see any side schemes. There are a few ways to help control the main scheme, like Hard to Ignore is really good when you're gonna be defending. Ever Vigilant removes two from the main if your aerial jump flip removes two from the main when you prevent some damage. And Bait and Switch is an interesting card that makes the villain attack you, which if depending on your setup, you might actually want that to happen. And then it removes four threat from the main scheme. But none of these cards interact with side schemes, which can be a real problem for protection. Some crisis comes out or just like some side scheme with a really detrimental effect and you're playing protection and solo can really, really be a problem. There is true grit that can affect side schemes, but it, it requires you to defend against an enemy attack and then it removes threat equal to your thwart. There's not a lot of heroes that are really good at defending and also have a thwart stat that's worth playing that card for. So I, I don't know, I haven't used that one much. So in solo protection, you're gonna be relying on your allies and your hero cards to be removing the threat. But if you're the protection player and multiplayer, then it's not really your job anyway, so you don't have to worry about it too much. In summary, if your hero has a high defense, can ready easily, or actively wants to be attacked for one reason or another, protection might be the aspect for you. 
comes to building a protection deck, it's pretty hard not to lean into some form of the perfect defense strategy. Unflappable and hard to ignore are just really, really fun to use. And there are so many damage effects to choose from that there's still a little bit of variety in how you approach it. There's Energy Barrier, Dauntless, Electrostatic Armor, Preemptive Strike, Sidestep, Full Like Water. Plus, if your hero has Retaliate, there are so many different ways that you can use to punish the villain when they attack you that you still have some options when deciding which version of the perfect defense deck you want to play. And especially if you're playing a hero like Spider-Man, Peter Parker, or Shadow Cat, Ghost Spider, any other hero that can get their defense high or wants to be attacked like Drax. This is kind of the protection deck right now. I'd say most of the more popular protection decks are using some form of this strategy and it's just, there's a reason. It's, it's a lot of fun. This works pretty well in solo because all that damage really adds up and you can just take the villain down. And if you play a version of this in multiplayer that has a higher emphasis on readying your hero with cards like Indomitable and Desperate Defense or using Never Back Down to stun the villain, you could pretty much defend for the whole table every round and that can feel pretty good in a four player game. But Perfect Defense isn't the only way to play protection. If you have a hero with a high attack potential, a ready and attack deck is a ton of fun. Like I said, there's a lot of readying in protection. So if you just use pretty much all the effects available to you, like Leading Blow, What Doesn't Kill Me, Ever Vigilant. If you have a hero like Drax or Spider-Woman, She-Hulk, and it works even better with aerial heroes like Thor and Nova because again, it gives you access to Ever Vigilant. Spectrum can do this as well. It's really fun to just keep attacking with your hero over and over again and getting the benefits of things like removing threat and healing. This is actually one of my favorite ways to play protection, just readying and attacking over and over again, especially, and I mentioned Nova, but because it also readies the helmet every time, this, this is a really fun way to play Nova. And a similar way to the attack and ready strategy, you can also just ignore damage altogether and continue to attack cards like Defensive Stance, Force Field Generator, Pin Down, Jump Flip, Defiance, Subdue. There are so many different ways that you could be preventing damage, Sidestep, or Perseverance to gain tough, things like that. There are so many ways to just prevent damage and protection that you could load your deck up with a ton of these effects and then just let the villain attack you every turn, prevent as much of the damage as you can and just keep attacking straight forward. This is another really fun way to play protection in solo. Now it's uh, a little bit less reliable because there's a lot of effects that trigger when the enemy attacks you these days, a lot of nasty boost effects or villains get bonuses like Magneto gets those counters and the Infinity Gauntlet can trigger, things like that. So. This isn't uh, the most reliable strategy, but I do think it's a really fun way to play. And the final deck I want to highlight for protection is the classic stun lock deck is still very much a thing. Tackle, Iron Fist, and Never Back Down are still really great options to just lock the villain down and not let them attack. Especially if you're playing a hero that already has access to stun in their kit, like Captain America. And there's a lot of other ones that have at least one or two stun effects in their kit. So as long as you're not playing a stalwart villain, steady. If you have enough stuff stun in your deck, steady is still fine. But just never letting the villain attack is a pretty valid strategy for winning the game. So this is another way you can take a protection deck. Now, I know protection doesn't tend to be a lot of people's favorite aspect, but I hope this gave you some fun ideas for trying out some green decks. And finally, we come to leadership, where justice and aggression know exactly who they are and what they're about. And protection is kind of a beautiful mess. Leadership is the aspect that binds all things together. If we're asking, how do I manage threat, how do I deal damage, and how do I survive long enough to win the game? Leadership's answer is... Super easy. Barely an inconvenience. And it all comes down to one thing. Allies. Now, I haven't talked about allies too much in this video because I plan to discuss them more when we start actually building decks in the next video. But allies are the strongest card type in the game, and blue has all the good ones. So, in discussing leadership's major themes, allies are at the heart of most of them. For example, just having access to so many good allies is a major blue theme. Allies are so strong because they provide versatility with their special ability, they can be used to attack or thwart, and then they take a hit for you preventing all the damage from a villain attack. And leadership's allies tend to be the ones with the best stats and abilities for the cost, so it's a double bonus. A lot of the cards here are some of the best cards in the game, you know, Maria Hill, thwarting for two and letting you draw, letting the whole table draw a card when she comes into play. Clue letting you search for an event in the top five cards. Squirrel Girl hitting every enemy in play for one. That's so much more useful than it sounds. Black Panther will fish out a leadership event. Black White Tiger 
draws cards. I mean, these are all just so incredibly useful and there are so many of them. Blue has so many options. So just having all the good allies is a major theme for blue. And it's allowed to have one more ally than everybody else because it also has access to the Triskelion. Now, the thing that is meant to balance the power of allies is their disposable nature. Unlike upgrades and supports that should stick around for the whole game, allies are temporary and fragile. But that's where our next major theme comes in, recursion. We have rapid response, regroup, and make the call. So yeah, allies are supposed to be disposable, but blue has a lot of really reliable ways of just bringing them back from the dead. So it doesn't really balance them all that well. And let us not forget that most heroes have a really good signature ally and leadership can really take advantage of that with those effects as well. So that's a pretty powerful theme that leadership has access to. Another thing Blue likes to do is upgrade allies. There's things like the reinforced suit, power glove, sky cycle, comms implant, laser blaster, inspire, there's so many, danger room training, all of these can be used to make the allies work even better than they already do. And there's also global buffs like Mighty Avengers. If you're playing all Avengers, gives all of your allies plus one, plus one. Team training gives them all plus one more hit point to keep them alive even longer to make use of these upgrades. Now where you might think, aha, but these types of cards can be inefficient because those allies aren't gonna last very long. You'd be right if another one of leadership's major themes was an ally healing and protection Things like United We Stand can heal allies, Inspiring Presence can heal it and ready it. Ready for Action can give an ally a tough. So these are ways to just get more use out of those allies. Or you can use things like Teamwork and Mass Attack to make use of your ally stats without having them take their consequential damage. So that's just one more way that leadership can make excellent use of allies. But it's not all about the allies. Blue does have quite a few effects that seek, seek to buff up your hero stats. Like R&D Facility will give you plus one, plus one. Avengers Assemble will give everybody, including your hero, plus one thwart, plus one attack. Blaze of Glory will boost all the Guardians in play, including your hero. Lead from the Front does similar. Morale Boost will boost your hero, plus one, plus one, plus one, and Moxie when you flip. So Leadership does like to play with allies, but it also does like to focus on your hero and really buff up their stats, which can be really fun if you've got access to a lot of readying. So Blue can answer every question you want to ask about how to win a game of Marvel Champions by throwing an army at it. The only thing it's really missing is access to Stun and Confuse. But not really, because you can just play Mockingbird and Professor X and recur them with Make the Call. So yeah, Blue can pretty much do it all. In summary, if you're playing a hero that can take care of itself so you don't have to chump block, you're playing a hero that has access to a lot of extra resources, or you would just like to start winning more often, leadership might be the right aspect for you. Now, as for building decks in blue, yes, they're mostly going to revolve around allies, but there are still some different ways to do it. A very basic and effective strategy in leadership is just load your deck with all the allies that draw cards. Maria Hill will let the whole table draw a card. Kalu gets you an event out of the top five. White Tiger lets you draw a number of cards equal to the villain stage. As well as just drawing cards, Beast will fetch you a resource card. Black Panther will fetch you a card out of the discard pile. It's not fancy, but it's actually really fun to just draw a ton of cards by playing cards over and over. And it's really strong too. And you can boost it with basic allies like Nick Fury, Ironheart, and if you can play our Moon Girl to draw even more cards. So while this strategy does really lean into the allies and it can feel like it's more about the allies, I actually really like it for a hero because all that card draw is gonna turn into you being able to play your hero cards more often. And I think that's a really, really fun way to play. And there's always the cheap Avenger Swarm using one cost allies like Ant-Man you can play for one if you want to, Stinger only costs one, Blade only costs one. It's really easy to get those guys out quickly, along with any other cheap Avengers like Squirrel Girl. With Avengers Tower and the Triskelion, you can actually get up to six allies on the board. And then from there, you can play Strength in Numbers to draw a ton of cards. You can use Band Together to get a lot of resources out of it. And then you can play Avengers Assemble to just ready them all up and do it again. You can throw Mighty Avengers in there to boost everybody and team training to keep them alive longer. This is a classic strategy that still works very, very well for the Avengers to this day. Instead of trying to get a bunch of allies on the board, you can just play one and then pile on the upgrades. Affectionately known as a Voltron deck, here you wanna play an ally like Iron Man or Ronin or Yondu. Iron Man gets discounts on upgrades. Ronin gets a boost just for having an upgrade and Yandu doesn't take consequential damage when he attacks. So these are really good targets for cards like Inspired, Reinforced Suit, 
Laser Blaster if they can take it, cards like that. And then you want to ready them with cards like Command Team and Get Ready to get even more uses out of them. And then keep them alive longer with cards like Team Training and First Aid. This is a particularly fun deck in multiplayer when you have a little bit more time to set up. And it's just a really, really good time. I mentioned Leadership also likes to boost your hero stats. There are a number of cards like Moxie that boost your stats when you flip. Morale boost just gives you plus one to all your stats. Lead from the front gives you plus one to thwart and attack. R&D facility the same. You can boost your stats up with cards like that and then make use of things like push ahead to remove a giant chunk of threat or go all out to do a ton of damage by exhausting your hero and adding all your stats together. These are really, really good cards to be using with heroes that can ready a lot like Spider Woman, Captain America, Quicksilver, Shadowcat has a lot of readies. Or you can add readies to people's deck with things like Earth's Mightiest Heroes and such. So this is a different way to play leadership that doesn't rely on allies. So it's different and I think a lot of fun. Another really fun leadership strategy that plays a little bit differently and works particularly well in multiplayer is leaning into the aerial trait. There's a lot of allies these days like Captain Marvel, Falcon, the other Falcon, and Adam Warlock that have the aerial trait. And then Cloud9 is a newer card that can boost all of their thwart by one just for being aerial. And then there is the pretty decent event, Air Supremacy, that allows you to deal three damage to a bunch of different enemies depending on how many aerial characters you control. Especially if you play this along with a hero that has good access to aerial like Thor, Nova, Spectrum, Ironheart. But really anybody can do it because it doesn't require your hero to be aerial. This is uh, just a different theme to lean into, a different way to play. It can be pretty fun and you can even slap Sky Cycle on somebody if you need even more aerial allies. So this is something that we're seeing more of in the game. I hope it continues. But for now, I think you can build a pretty decent aerial deck. And one thing I just want to quickly emphasize again, I said it after the Justice round of decks, but I want to say it again here towards the end. These aren't the only ways to play leadership with the heroes. These are just the ways that the sort of aspect provides, but there are lots and lots of ways for each individual hero to make use of a card or two that can be very unique to them. I'm hoping to showcase that more in the next video when we actually start building decks, but certainly here are a lot of different ways to play leadership that the aspect itself provides. Now, I'm a big fan of leadership, but I know it can turn some people off for being too strong or it's just not enough about your hero, and I totally get that. But I think a lot of these deck concepts are super fun to play. I've done most of them myself, and I hope there's something fun here for you as well. Whew, there you go. I hope that breakdown of each aspect was helpful to you and that there were at least some deck ideas that get you excited to put something of your own together. Now, if you're wondering where the basic cards went, those will be more of a focus in the next video. Basic is great at filling in the gaps and showing up our weaknesses in our deck, and that will be what we're talking about next time. I want to thank you so much for joining me, and if you found this video helpful or enjoyable, I ask if you would be so kind as to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so you'll see part three when it comes out. I hope to see you next time we get up in game. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.